So uh, my name is David Robinson, and uh, I'm honored to be uh, asked to be the moderator with such an esteemed, incredible panel of uh, guests. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm an old journalist, came out of Morehouse College, uh, been in the movement in many ways uh, for a long time, and ended up uh, in the Harold Washington administration in Chicago chasing ways to solve big problems. Um, and one of the big problems was industry was going offshore and things were changing. Um, I'll tell you how they changed. We lost 400,000 jobs, and I lived in a neighborhood that was in the shadow of U.S. Southworks, uh, U.S. Steel Southworks, which at that time was the most profitable steel producer in the world. And uh, tell you what happens when you lose 400,000 jobs. Ten years later, uh, lived in the same house uh, that I got from my folks, and I heard uh, machine gun fire every night, and uh, the communities that I uh, saw people go to work every morning, no, nobody went to work anymore. And what happens is you get violence, you get all those things. So in uh, response to that, my boss at Manufacturing Renaissance, an organization devoted to revitalizing manufacturing and figuring out how we make that connection to create jobs again, he discovered that if we could put a program together where we put young people, uh, give them the 21st century advanced skills training they needed to meet the needs of manufacturers, that we could create uh, a new set of workers that could have, have those jobs again. So Joaquin Buford was one of our first students that graduated out of our uh, class. Now, Joaquin Buford at the time was involved in street life and was busy in the hallways of the school that our program happens to operate in. Uh, and we managed to convince him to get industry certifications so he could get these, one of these jobs that were available among the manufacturers we work with. Fast forward, Joaquin Buford now is a union steward. He's buying a, a, a three flat. He bought his mom a house. He is now where he once terrorized the corner in the community he lives in. He now is a leader in that community. And young people approach him and ask how he did it. How did he do it? High wage pathway through manufacturing. That's how he did it. Now, Rakim goes and spreads the manufacturing high wage gospel to his kid, to his colleagues. We have a group called the Young Manufacturers Association. He's one of our big members. So what's happening is, on the street, this makes a difference. So I ask you policy folks, because you're the guys that told us that manufacturing's dead, go get a four-year degree. I want you to really think this one through, though. How do we do this? How do we make sure we have hundreds of thousands of Rakims? That's what we're trying to get to today. So I want to begin by introducing our incredible panel. Um, I want to begin first with Thea Lee. Hello, Thea. Thea joined uh, the, she's the president of the Economic Policy Institute. And as incoming president is November 1st last year and became president January 1st of 2018. Uh, she has a long-standing relationship with EPI, having begun her career as an international trade economist in the 90s, committed to EPI's mission of building an economy that works for everyone. So without going into the whole thing, she's got an amazing background, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce the next person. Um, and that is, forgive me, we've got lots of stuff here. Susan Helper, and I was fascinated by this. Uh, um, Susan is the Frank Tracy Carlton Professor of Economics at um, Weatherhead School of Management, Case Western Reserve University. Uh, Susan is the, uh, uh, she has a Chief Economist, the U.S. Department of Commerce, and a member of the White House staff, she was, and she served as Chair of Economics Department and has been visiting scholar at the University of o Oxford, University of Cal Berkeley, Harvard University, MIT, and her research focuses on globalization of supply chains and how U.S. manufacturing might be revitalized. So another incredible uh, member of the team. Then next to uh, Susan is Steven Herzenberger, uh, Herzenberg, forgive me, uh, and he's an economist, executive director of Keystone Research Center, uh, an economic think tank, has a Ph.D. in economics from MIT. Uh, are we seeing a pattern here, you guys? Yeah. Uh, KRC, Steve helps develop and advocate for state manufacturing agenda incorporating the Pennsylvania, former Pennsylvania Governor Rendell's 2004 Manufacturing Innovation Plan. So he's been at this a while, and 
Uh, we'll, we'll get into a lot more with Dr. Herzenberg. And then final, uh, one more. Hang on, bear with me. And next, of course, is uh, our host and, and my colleague, Andy Stetner. Uh, Andy is a senior fellow at, of course, the Century Foundation. And his uh, career uh, as a nonprofit leader spans 20 years of experience modernizing workforce uh, protections and social insurance programs. And he is currently really kind of the, the spearhead for a lot of the work that we're doing now. And I'm really happy to, that uh, they let me play, play with the big boys on this. So. Um, and finally, uh, David and I just reconnected after remembering something from 25, 30 years ago. Uh, David Wilhelm, partner at C and uh, uh, at, uh, can, help me pronounce this. Hecate. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> or Hecate, yeah, what do you say? Like yeah. the beer. <laughs> like the beer, all right, good. Well, I guess microbrewery, you know, kind of works these days. Well, good. well uh, David, uh, uh, his career spans worlds of energy, finance, politics, and academia, uh, and public policy. He's a partner now at, at uh, the place he said, and <laughs> the developer of uh, large-scale renewable energy projects around the globe. Uh, one of the, a couple of the interesting things David's involved in is um, this uh, venture capital approach that lead to the creation of, um, of successful innovation of ecosystems. And uh, he's in, 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 he works a lot around uh, his alma mater, Ohio University, and he's helping to lead the, the campaigns of some of the best known politicians, including with Bill Clinton, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, uh, former Mayor Richard Daley, and one of my mentors, former Senator Paul Simon, late Paul Simon. Uh, after, uh, well, let's get into that later, so. All right, um, what an amazing crew. Please give them a hand. All right, Andy, um, I'd like to, to start with you. Um, what are your, you, you just did this three city tour in the heartland, beginning to kind of explore where we are with this issue. Uh, after doing this tour and uh, kind of looking at what was on the ground, what kind of workforce strategies do you think we need to facilitate good paying jobs in manufacturing? So it was a real honor to work on this tour with um, such great leaders. People like Tom Croft, who's here today, who really refused to accept this idea that deindustrialization and decline of uh, the, rust, the so called Rust Belt was inevitable. I think no one, and I'll owe this a little bit, I'm from Detroit, a certain Midwestern skepticism. No one has rose-colored glasses to think the economy is going to go back to a place where 30 percent uh, of the jobs uh, in the heartland, like they were in 1980, were in manufacturing, and was the you know the the, the key source of a middle-class life uh, in the Midwest. But there's also no doubt in the minds of the community leaders we met with, and expert researchers on the panel and and elsewhere that manufacturing remains a critical part of the economy in the Midwest, uh, and to our national competitiveness. And I actually think there's more consensus now than there was five or 10 years ago that a forward-looking manufacturing sector is one vital ingredient to a more diversified economic future. Now, it was striking to me that our research found that in this, particularly in the small towns of the Midwest, still today, one in four private sector jobs are in manufacturing. These are jobs that pay more, and as our colleagues at EPI know, it's not as much as they used to, um, but still pay more than other jobs, especially for workers without a college degree. And to be precise, it's three dollars more per hour uh, in Ohio. And more importantly, that manufacturing is greatly underappreciated as a source of high-tech careers and innovation already. And it, for the Midwest, it's really one of the key angles into the cutting-edge industries of the future, like those around sustainable, uh, sustainable energy. Now, when it comes to jobs, this conference comes at a time when manufacturing is on the upswing. And when we were in Ohio, the steel workers that came together with us from Cleveland told me every plant that they represent in the state of Ohio is hiring. In Chicago, we found that there are twice as many jobs open as workers were hired in manufacturing. And one problem that manufacturing faces with a greatly aging workforce is that the programs that they relied upon to get a pipeline of younger people into manufacturing career high schools and apprenticeships were allowed to basically wither almost to nothing. And, and a generation of parents 
who experience the strong, big decline in the industry have told their kids not to go into this type of work. But I think a theme throughout this tour is that communities are taking action to respond to the opportunity. There are new programs like AFL-CIO's um, uh, industrial maintenance technician, a multi-state apprenticeship. Randy Burst is here from Wisconsin, helped to put that program together. So where there are all these automated factories, and there was a tremendous need for repair workers, and there wasn't the same pipeline from the shop floor. And so they started this new apprenticeship program, uh, including long overdue steps to reach out uh, to young people, including in communities of color, like David has, has done as well. And I think that's critical because community of colors really wants to use manufacturing in the Midwest as a step to, into the middle class. And there's tremendous potential in manufacturing for good paying careers. Uh, and, and uniquely, we heard this in our interviews for those who have criminal records. But it's going to take a much more proactive approach than we've had, a much more proactive approach of working with leaders uh, in, in communities than your typical workforce training programs happen. Um, and it's going to take manufacturers providing better jobs, um, kind of throwing off an over-reliance on temporary agencies, paying decent wages, and respecting collective bargaining. The message that we heard uh, in the Midwest, and I think critical for us politically, that fair trade is a necessary condition for industrial renewal, but it's not sufficient. Um, we, we know that China's made in 2025 uh, effort is a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar effort to become leaders in everything from aerospace to railway equipment. Our answer in terms of the program is Manufacturing USA, which is helping to create great new products like 3D printing Nunstown and Super Strong Metals in Detroit, but it's not enough to compete. And the agenda we have you know, before you, this federal policy agenda, is, is a kind of a bold $12.2 billion per year plan to compete. For example, taking the Manufacturing Institute um, program from the 14 we have to the 45 uh, that we envision. There's tremendous interest in apprenticeships. Uh, and we should be doubling manufacturing apprenticeships in the next five years. But that's not enough. We have to have a lot more investments uh, starting at the high school level into the K-12 pipeline. And we have to build strong partnerships between community and business and labor um, to make sure when we're building out apprenticeships, that it really expands opportunity. And it looks like we might have a new NAFTA, maybe one that's better than what we have. But even with a better trade deal, we know there's going to be plant closings. And we know that the federal programs that communities have relied upon have been a disappointment. So if we're going to have another vote on NAFTA, we have to have a much more serious and streamlined program of adjustments. And I think my last one I would say is that while this tour was developed you know, in, in the Midwest, um, we think it's a message that leaders in every part of the country should carry forward uh, if we want to create uh, a highways economy. Thank you so much, Andy. And uh, before we go to our next question, uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. And also, I want that to sink in a little bit that, you know, so there's a lot of work that went into those three city tours. And I think Andy tried his best to distill that. But we'll, we'll un uncover a lot of the juice in there uh, a little bit later. But first, uh, everyone that uh, should have a uh, a packet um, in the uh, the folders that are the, in your folders, you'll you'll see uh, note cards that will allow you to write a question when we get to the Q and A portion. So I encourage you to take a look in there, and if you have questions as we continue the panel, um, our staff will be at the uh, uh, in the aisles to collect your questions uh, once you begin to write them down. Uh, also, I want to again just thank Senator Gillibrand for really kind of kicking this thing off. I don't think we did that properly. Please give her one more hand. All right, moving on. Um, so, Sue, I'd like to, to direct the next question to you. Um, there will only be uh, jobs if industry can become more advanced and competitive. It keeps up. Um, and so what needs to be done to build on recent federal uh, initiatives and the momentum in manufacturing that's beginning to kind of push this along, but what do you think needs to happen here? Well, so I guess first of all, I'd point out that I think one of the Can you hear? <laughs> all right, are you on? You're on. Mic up a little. One of the problems that we have in U.S. manufacturing is we're kind of stuck in the middle. We're not uh, 
thankfully as low wage as china and mexico but we're also not as high tech as germany and i think so promoting technology in a in a particular way that i'll define is really important and there's a lot of really cool ideas out there so the oak ridge national lab has made a lot of progress on how you might use 3d printing to make tooling which is really the foundation of lots of manufacturing it's a very high skilled arena and a job that has gone largely to china because of their efforts there there's also really cool stuff in data analytics where you can apply technology and the kind of robotics that gives you a lot of data in real time really quickly you can use that for process improvement so we can think about the kinds of improvements in you prevent maintenance that's not needed you can figure out when something's likely to go down you can do predictive maintenance you can save material etc there's a lot of very important and exciting things you might think this is going to lead to lost jobs i think that's that's actually not been true in the u.s in fact that companies that are more productive at least stay the same and generally increase their employment that's been true for decades we have a barrier i think in getting this technology adopted so over forty percent of manufacturing employment in the u.s is in small firms these firms lack the ability often they're kind of home alone in contrast to their counterparts in germany where they don't get a lot of support for training or technology so very simple things i was at a very small coder in cleveland where the case western wants to work with him to have a kind of data analytics program it basically means he'd have to do it he'd have to invest a little bit in equipment he's not convinced he doesn't see it even though he spends about double what he needs to spend on materials he over coats to make sure he's not under coding so if he had better process control he could easily save ten twenty percent to bring a lot of stuff back so i think there's a problem of stuff not being adopted at all there's also an ideology around how this stuff should be adopted if you listen to silicon valley there's a lot of discussion about how automation makes it possible to control things remotely and i think that a won't work and b it won't lead to good jobs and so if you think about doing the kind of apprenticeships that andy has mentioned the kind of advanced education that combines theory and practice and get workers on the floor to be doing some of this data analytics combine their insights with some statistics with some easy to use computer programs that would be great so what i'd like to see is it just is a big in this particular area a movement in the manufacturing usa to kind of link the technology and the job training a little more closely we think of these things as separate the technology falls from the sky and the training responds i think if we can train workers and unions to be involved in helping to design the technology you could imagine a you know a new federal appropriation to these u.s manufacturing usa institutes that would do that i also think that just that we should need to be bolder so that the whole program that we're talking about today is two billion dollars that may sound like a lot it's a lot that compared to what we have spent but uh congress has just passed two billion dollars to prop up a single tank plant in lima ohio um you know the sort of old technology not obvious that it needs to be used i think we can do better i think we can spend more i think we need to spend more the chinese program is made in china uh is vastly bigger I think we can afford this kind of thing, and I can't think we can't afford to not do it. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Wilhelm, um, I'd like to have you talk a bit about moderator error. I'm sorry. I'd uh, <laughs> um, like to have you talk a bit about um, the program that you're working on, driving capital investment uh, to bring solar into uh, the solar industry to one of the most challenging parts of the region where, where you're working, and how federal government can partner with private sector to bring more investment like yours. So talk a little bit about what you're working on, and then let's talk about how we invest it. 
All right, well, I'm glad the poster has a solar panel. <laughs> this is a well-organized conference, let me tell you. Um, well, I, I'll do this as quickly as I can. About 10 years ago, I had an idea. I knew nothing about solar, absolutely nothing. Um, but I knew something about Appalachian, Ohio, because that's where I grew up. And I knew that in southeastern Ohio, we, had about, we have about 80,000 acres of land that was strip mined and reclaimed and not used. And 80,000 acres of land. The machine that stripped the land was called the Big Muskie. And Big Muskie was the largest crane, drag line, uh, shovel. You could, put, you could put two high school bands into that shovel. I know because I've seen the picture of the bands <laughs> in the shovel. And to power that, you had to bring an electricity infrastructure to power the big muskie. You had to bring an electricity infrastructure out to the big muskie equal to what it took to power about 30 to 40,000 homes. The land, electricity infrastructure, and at that time, Ohio seemed serious about fulfilling the mandate of the renewable portfolio standard. And I thought to myself, OK, American Electric Power, the biggest buyer of coal in the world, probably needs to diversify its mix of energy. So I had an idea. Southeastern Ohio is a utility scale solar project waiting to happen. That was my idea. And I went to AEP, and I presented this idea to them. And they said, you're right. I was stunned. <laughs> um, and, and they immediately, almost immediately, provided me with a power purchase agreement for what then was an inconceivably large solar project of 50 megawatts, right in the heart of Appalachian, Ohio. And then I thought, Oh my God, this is, this is relatively easy. I have a 50 megawatt power purchase agreement <laughs> from a totally bankable off taker. I'm in business. And then I thought, I got a 50 megawatt power purchase agreement. I bet I could convince a manufacturer to come in if I gave them all the business. And so I called Michael Peck. Some of you know Michael Peck. He represented a Spanish company called Isopatan. And Isopatan, in return for the 50 megawatts, was willing to build a manufacturing plant in the state of Ohio. All right. Then we had, we had regime change. <laughs> <laughs> and this amazing idea fell into the hands of the Public Utilities Commission that was headed by a climate-denying chair, and my project got killed. <coughs> but a group in Chicago of actual power plant developers who were stunned and disgusted that I had received a 50 megawatt uh, PPA, <laughs> knowing nothing about solar, <laughs> said, we know something about solar. Let's take this idea. Let's, uh, let's uh, go down to San Antonio. Let's increase it uh, by a factor of eight. Let's build 400 megawatts, and let's bring in the entire supply chain. The panels, the inverters, the wiring, the cabling, you name it, to San Antonio in the immediate vicinity of the 400 megawatt project we're going to build. And they did it. They stole my idea. But they did it. They created several hundreds of permanent manufacturing jobs along the way and got all kinds of international and national awards for doing so. While I was flailing uh, in, in Ohio. But to their credit, probably out of tremendous guilt, they called me up and said, we offer you a partnership in our company. Let's do this elsewhere. And I said, let's go back to Ohio. But anyway, to fast forward, American Electric Power, to its credit, 
has stuck with this. And they have agreed in a settlement that involves the Sierra Club and all, all kinds of uh, players in the state of Ohio to build 400 megawatts of solar generation in the middle of what was coal country in southeastern Ohio, the middle of Trump country, the middle of the opioid belt, 400 megawatts of solar generation is going to be installed. Uh, and uh, uh, they are linking that to our basic idea. And our basic idea is if you're going to build 400 megawatts of solar, if you have a purchase order of that size, shame on all of us if we don't leverage that moment to create permanent manufacturing jobs for the sons and daughters of uh, the people that used to mine the coal that built this country. Excellent. Well, and let so me that, leverage that moment. We, that's where we are. I hope you read about it in a, a couple of weeks that uh, uh, this project is moving forward. We fought for it. Manufacturing jobs are going to be the result. People are going to go to work. Outstanding. Thank you so much. That's, that's exciting. Very exciting. So, um, Thea, um, I know you've been waiting. You've been writing all these notes. I can't wait to see what you said. Uh, we know there are many things that the federal government can do to help communities rebuild their economy, but we can't do it if our foreign trade deals are unfair. After a year of controversial actions talks that we all have heard about, uh, what's the direction we need to take trade policy so that we can rebuild our heartland communities? Thank you so much, David. Um, I am delighted to be here. You good, Micah? and Bernard Schwartz and our other sponsors in, um, in taking on this important issue at this moment in history, because I think this is the right moment in history. Yeah. Can you mind um, up just a touch? So I think, you know, Andy Stetner said earlier that um, getting trade policy right is a necessary but not sufficient condition for dealing with some of the problems that manufacturing communities are facing. And I think that's exactly right. Sometimes I say it's the first thing. It's not the only thing, but it is the first thing we need to do because trade and investment policy really sets a competitive frame for how we're engaged in an increasingly integrated global economy. It determines really the kind of labor market uh, conditions, our regulatory structure, uh, every decision really that business makes in terms of hiring and firing and where to put production and what to produce and when to produce it and so on is part of, we need to think about it in the context of the global, the trade and investment rules that we have negotiated both globally and the ones that we put in place domestically, whether it's our unilateral trade programs or the trade agreements that we sign or how we engage in the multilateral rule setting at the World Trade Organization. So that frame is incredibly important. And I think when we think about our competitive strategy, and I think Sue mentioned this before, that we're talking about, you know, are we on a high road strategy? Or how do we see ourselves in the global economy? And I think one of the mistakes we made in the 90s and 2000s was um, maybe coming at this from the wrong place, that we are going to compete in the global economy by cutting taxes, cutting regulations, cutting wages, busting unions, and being as cheap as possible. But for a wealthy country like the United States, that is not the right strategy. That is a losing strategy, because we are not going to get our wages uh, and our taxes below those in Mexico, China, and Bangladesh, and we shouldn't want to. We need to think how we're going to be successful in the global economy as a wealthy, industrialized, high-skilled, high-capital uh, country. And that involves a whole different set of concerns. But I want to say today that I think the, our current trade and investment regime has utterly failed to support good jobs and thriving communities, to protect democratic decision-making, and to nurture an innovative manufacturing sector, because we've made a lot of wrong decisions along the way. And it's not a question of trading or not trading. That is not our choice. We cannot turn our back on the global economy. We shouldn't think about turning our back on the global economy. But we really can uh, go into those deals with a whole different set of priorities. Rather than negotiating a whole generation of trade deals that protected multinational corporate profits <coughs> over jobs, that encouraged outsourcing over exports, and that failed to shape our trade relationship with China in a sustainable way that, that we could live with. So there is a basic conflict here. And the conflict really is whether our trade policy serves multinational corporations and Wall Street, or whether it serves the heartland communities and the people who are trying to do the work and trying to be successful on American soil, whether it's business or labor or agriculture. 
the current stock trade policies, I have to say, are, are not the answer because uh, President Trump or candidate Trump correctly identified a problem and a vulnerability and a vacuum that had not been addressed by previous both Democratic and Republican administrations and policymakers. And he <coughs> took advantage of that void. But he, didn't, he hasn't articulated a coherent and comprehensive economic strategy. He has implemented a tariff regime erratically and inconsistency, creating maximum uncertainty, which is actually not what is needed. When you use tariffs strategically, what you want to do is give your trading partners and give businesses a clear sense of how they need to change behavior in order to go forward, not uh, have everything be about personality and petty um, rivalry. He hasn't coordinated with our allies. And in order to be effective, especially in addressing a, a challenge like unfair trade with China, a more effective policy would be one that was coordinated with our allies like Europe, like Canada, so that we could have a, uh, a concerted, coordinated front. And it hasn't been paired with a set of domestic policies, and I think that's the, the bulk of this um, panel, as it should be, on tax, on infrastructure, on skills that would really lift up American workers and businesses and help them be more successful in the global economy. So we can and we must do better, and I think we can. Um, and we, the key, uh, the key areas are one. We need, to, we need, we do need to effectively and consistently and aggressively enforce our trade laws, and that is particularly important with respect to China. If you look at our trade balance, the trade, the composition of our trade, our imbalanced trade relationship with China is an outlier. It's different from the trade relationships we have with other countries. So we need to address that. Deal with currency misalignment, workers' rights. We need to go back to multilateral negotiations with different priorities. The areas where multilateral coordination is essential are tax policy, coordinating tax policy, ensuring that climate measure changes that we take, that we should be taking, are not a competitive disadvantage for American manufacturers. Uh, lift up workers' rights proactively, not just wait until they're horrible, egregious cases, but really take that as a centerpiece of what we need to do. And, uh, and address currency misalignment with a new Bretton Woods style agreement because, and I'll talk more about that later, uh, about how we can really um, address some of the <coughs> built-in systematic competitive disadvantages that American manufacturers and workers face every day. Thank you. You, you hear that, policy people? We have a little work ahead of us, sir. So, <coughs> Steve, uh, for this first section of, of our panel, I'm going to give you the last word on, on this thing. Um, and what I'd like to do is um, ask what, what all this means, what kind of economics you're trying to build in Pennsylvania, and, and, and how the federal government can be partnered to help build it and maybe spread it throughout you know, the, the nation on this. Uh, thanks uh, very much. Uh, I do come to you today from the heartland state of Pennsylvania, and I bring you greetings from our 10-year board member, um, Governor Tom Wolf. Um, there is a little video. He was not able to come here because he's kind of busy between now and the beginning of November. Um, <laughs> but um, he did do a little video, which is going to be tweeted out and on the web page of the Century Foundation. So I encourage folks to um, look at that. Um, the real median wage of non-college white men in Pennsylvania today is still about $2 an hour less than 40 years ago. The real median wage of non-college black men in Pennsylvania is nearly $4 an hour uh, less than 40 years ago. Those medians for the state as a whole are um, uh, disguise the fact that the cuts in wages in western Pennsylvania in the early 1980s and since the early 1980s are larger. Um, of course, it is true that women still make less than men, uh, which is important to acknowledge. Non-college men are a big group. 71% of prime-age Pennsylvania men today are in that group. Um, obviously, the loss of manufacturing jobs had the leading role in those wage declines. At the state level in Pennsylvania, you can point to innovations in manufacturing policy under Republican Governor uh, Thornburg and Democratic Governor Casey in the late 70s and 1980s. We think Pennsylvania was the model for the Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program. Maybe Ohio thinks it, it was. Uh, 
Um, we also think Pennsylvania was a model for one of the forerunners of today's Manufacturing USA Institute, the Ben Franklin Technology Partnership. Yet the response of Pennsylvania policymakers to manufacturing's implosion was inadequate even in the 1980s. Since then, and most of this period I've got firsthand knowledge of in Pennsylvania, state policy on manufacturing with an increasingly conservative legislature has been nothing short of legislative malpractice. Um, as rural areas have lost manufacturing, first manufacturing was lost in Philly, then Pittsburgh, um, they uh, get low wage services. They don't get a mix of high wage and low wage. Yet our rural uh, lawmakers have done nothing about the fact that, for example, 23 Pennsylvania rural counties uh, don't even have a branch campus of a community college. It's been all about cutting taxes for people who don't live in their districts and cutting spending for programs that their districts do depend on. Uh, those areas have, have been completely disinterested disinter in a manufacturing strategy. And at the national level, uh, the most visible manufacturing policy has been an approach on trade that the heartland uh, sees uh, as tearing its heart out. There's a reason that heartland folks are angry and feel ignored and disrespected by elites. There's also a political opportunity that we keep missing. Um, America and the heartland states needed a real manufacturing strategy 40 years ago, and they still need one today. I want to thank the Century Foundation for leading an effort to finally getting us a U.S. manufacturing strategy. I also want to highlight um, in the documents released by the Century Foundation today the notion of a federal state race to the top in manufacturing. We mean a race to the top in terms of wages instead of a race to the bottom in terms of wages, but we also mean a race to the top in terms of um, state and local manufacturing uh, policies. Um, as you've heard hints of, states and regions actually have a lot of knowledge of the workforce innovation, technology assistance, and capital initiatives that can support high wage manufacturing. They need more dollars for those initiatives from the federal government. But states also, and regions also, waste a lot of money on the war between the states. Uh, did someone say uh, Amazon um, <laughs> or Ohio tank plants? Um, <laughs> states and localities, therefore, could also use from the federal government some discipline, some carrots and sticks that reduce the amount of money they waste on the bad stuff so they can reprogram it to the good stuff with some new money and less waste of money on corporate welfare. Uh, and a more integrated set of policies, the U.S. and its um, heartland can grow high-wage manufacturing jobs again. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, outstanding. So, <laughs> so uh, this is the part that we're going to switch gears a bit. Um, and I'm going to ask a single question. Each of the panelists will have one minute to answer the question. Um, of course, they've been uh, prepared for this one. Then, uh, while they're doing that, if you wouldn't mind, those of you that do have questions and have thought this through, please do write them down on, on your cards. Uh, our team will be in either aisle to, uh, to collect them. Then I'm going to ask a question that they didn't know about. <laughs> and, and we're going to see how that goes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let's, let's begin. And what I'd like to do is start, no, I'll start with Thea. Uh, then we'll, we'll go straight down for this question. Um, and the question is, one thing the federal government can do to help revitalize manufacturing communities. One thing, and you have one minute. Okay. I think the one thing that I would choose is addressing currency misalignment. I know that sounds really boring and technical, but the whole point is that when other governments systematically intervene in currency markets to make their goods cheaper and our goods more expensive, that puts American workers at a complete disadvantage. Thank you. So currency misalignment, and this could, uh, if we had did this, if we addressed it, we would save millions of manufacturing jobs. It would not cost taxpayers a single penny, and it would be good for both domestic business and labor as well as agriculture. Why haven't we done it before? You might ask if it's that easy as Thea is saying. I think the reason is that uh, within the U.S., this very strong interest from Wall Street and multinational corporations are in the opposite way. Because if you're a multinational corporation, you're producing abroad to sell in the United States, currency manipulation or misalignment is actually a bonus for you. So if we take the interests of workers, farmers, and business seriously, we will address currency misalignment. Excellent. I wanted to follow up on something that um, 
taxi workers, President Leo Gerard said in the, vi in the uh, video about uh, we're going to have either good jobs and a clean environment, either both or neither. So, so, so Leo Gerard said in the video that uh, we're either going to have both clean environment and good jobs or we're going to have neither. I think we can and should have both. And uh, I think a way to do that, um, I'd love to see uh, more projects like the one that David is talking about all around the country. Um, I think we can fund these um, in the long term. Clean energy is cheaper in many ways. In the short term, there's uh, this, this idea of these, these race between the states, these bidding wars, really expensive. The New York Times a few, minute, a few years ago uh, estimated it cost $80 billion per year that we spend on these unproductive subsidies to uh, individual companies to, to locate in a particular place as opposed to some other place. To tax that federally uh, raised uh, tens of billions of dollars devoted to uh, high wage, uh, good jobs in manufacturing, other sectors, uh, clean energy being a pretty important uh, priority. One thing, okay. Um, there's a lot of experience in Pennsylvania, some other states, with um, what are called industry partnerships in, this, in the training area. Um, I think what those do is get businesses with common skill needs together, and they do good things more cost effectively. But the most important thing they do is they bring uh, folks facing, manufacturers facing the same problems together to learn from one another. And when it goes really well, um, the folks that are best practice actually teach uh, standard practice or low road companies that they don't have to operate that way. The idea of manufacturing partnerships actually goes be to it, that can address common needs, goes well beyond just workforce. It goes to uh, marketing, it goes to uh, adopting new technology, it goes to innovation. So I think one initiative, bringing together manufacturing partnerships in new ways that in the end, subtly moves towards the high road um, would be one initiative. So my <laughs> short answer is to enact our 12 point $2 billion plan. <laughs> but the uh, slightly longer one is that we, most of these subsidies go to very large manufacturing companies. Most manufacturers are small. And we should be doing much more to help save uh, those jobs. Uh, and there, you know, when I got involved in this work, this tremendous work that, that Tom has done uh, in, in, in in Pennsylvania that if you can surveil companies that are at risk through all the data that states collect uh, and uh, you know other hooks of intelligence, you can get in there with proactive business turnaround assistance and not have to do all the cleanup when a company closes. And we, under law, states are required to, to do this now under WIOA, but the implementation has been uh, uh, very uh, weak. So I think it's, it's a, something that we should really have in every uh, in every community across the country. Um, I missed the call in preparation for this, so I didn't know this question was coming. Um, ah, there you go. And, 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 anyway, uh, I th I think the creation of financial vehicles that specifically target uh, provide capital to manufacturing initiatives, perhaps linked to manage, uh, manufacturing cooperatives, something like that. I, we all often talk about, in our country, we need an infrastructure bank. Like that's some sort of new exotic idea. We have an infrastructure bank in the United States of America. It's called the Rural Utility Service. It's at the US Department of Agriculture. It's been in existence for 80 years, and it was created to help build out the electricity infrastructure in rural America during the New Deal. It is an extraordinarily successful existing infrastructure bank. There's another, what else could you call it but an infrastructure bank? So I want an infrastructure bank, but I want a, I want a manufacturing cooperative bank. I want financial institutions that are targeted to the social impact that, that it's created as a result of the growth of these enterprises. Great, excellent, um, wonderful answers. So here's the moderator question. 
uh, and while you guys are answering, the way we'll do this, I've got about 10 minutes for this, so we're going to kind of keep the same format, but we're going to start with you, David. You'll get two minutes this time, and each of you then will respond to this question. What is the role as we move toward trying to, to create this high wage, high road uh, um, opportunity and, and, and you know, revitalize these communities? What is the role that manufacturers should be playing? The employer, what is the role that they play? And once, is it sus sustainable? Because we saw this sort of go away 35 years ago. Now, how do we keep it sustained? And what is the role that manufacturers should play? So I ask each of you that question. What is the role that manufacturers should play in, on, in trying to achieve this high road, this revitalization effort? Well, I, th I think they play it. Um, you know, manufacturers, I went to Bilbao. Has anybody been to Bilbao? Has anybody been to Mondragon? Has anybody been, that's the role manufacturers should play. I, I, talk about I assure you, you should go. <laughs> because it, it is a place in Spain that's not dissimilar to the Appalachian region of our country. Yet it has a vibrant manufacturing sector. I think 75,000 manufacturing jobs have been created in the region around Bilbao. What makes Bilbao special? An absolute commitment to the, the principle of cooperative uh, work and cooperative finance and worker ownership. But they don't make a big deal of it. If you're briefed by the people of Mondragon, they'll barely talk about that. <laughs> what they talk about is the fact that they are competitive via this strategy uh, in, in worldwide competition, in global competition. They don't wear it on their sleeve, but they have 75,000 jobs in northern Spain, in the middle of nowhere, and I am jealous, and I wish we had it in Appalachia, and I wish we had that spirit, and I wish our workers were engaged the way the, the workers I spoke to were engaged in, in, in their work. And um, I don't know if that gets at your question, no, but that's good. what I thought of. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. I think the, the first thing that comes to mind is this you know, taking the mindset of looking at workers rather than costs as assets. Uh, and that means uh, in, in investing more uh, in, in training, that means paying decent wages uh, and benefits, that, that means uh, being uh, not so aversive to collective bargaining. Um, and I think with, without that, we're not gonna solve these real challenges manufacturing have of hiring uh, workers that are gonna build a career in manufacturing uh, if we don't do that. And I'll just I'm gonna be you know, very direct about it. You know, my, my brother-in-law is a um, you know, very skilled and trained tool die maker about to approach retirement at, at Ford. And he said, if I, don't, I can't imagine how a young man in the same place I was could take a job working at Ford Motor Company at the entry level making $16 an hour when he can make you know, $11, $12 an hour working in retail, and it's a lot harder job. And so we, we're not addressing these basic things. We're not going to turn around this country. Uh, manufacturers have to be in, um, engaged in the creation and oversight and funding um, of the support structure that makes potentially all manufacturers, higher wage and more competitive. So the workforce support structure, the technic technical assistance support structure, the financial support structure, the innovation support structure. They know their business. People like me don't. <laughs> but, they, but, but they're passive. They're disorganized. They won't. They're, not, uh, they're very hard to organize to create that support structure that they all need. I did an interview two, two days ago with an apprenticeship uh, director of a big Western <laughs> Pennsylvania firm that does a lot of apprenticeship, has like 50 people in apprenticeships now. And he talked about how his peers want people to show up in the door with the skills they need. And he's like, manufacturers are problem solvers. 
right? Why won't they engage <laughs> with solving their workforce problems? All they do is whine about the people that <laughs> come to them. And so, and this is a company that you know absolutely puts its money where its mouth is and puts its time where its mouth is. But it's a more generic issue. That guy gets the fact that we have to come together with community colleges and career and technical programs and with our peers. And we have to solve the problem that we all collectively need to solve so that the next generation of manufacturing workers in Western Pennsylvania is fantastic. But it goes beyond just training. I think I'd build on, on what you guys have said in, in the way that I think a lot of manufacturers and a lot of employers have um, kind of accepted this low road idea that the way you win is by using markets and trying to find the lowest short term uh, wage costs and also the lowest short term supply costs uh, and not sort of invest in building communities the kind that Steve's talked about. So, uh, so I think that's the overarching frame so is to actually think and sell this idea that the high road actually can be a way of making money, uh, private profits. Uh, we can help that through government policy, but I also think talking about these success stories is really important. And I would add, so it's not just um, taking of workers as assets, but also suppliers as assets. So, so the average manufacturing company has about two thirds of its cost in its supply chain. Uh, only about 13% is, is direct labor. So this interface with other manufacturing companies, whether they're big or small, is actually really a key thing. They tend to buy in the, this very unsophisticated, what's the lowest unit cost I can find? And not thinking through, this is where big data can help. You know, you, you bought that thing from the cheaper supplier, you saved $1,000, but then they shut your plant down and you lost 100000 can you tie that back and, and sort of think about a partnership that, that avoids defects, uh, that makes sure parts arrive on time, uh, you know, really create a productive ecosystem and supply chain through, I think, selling this high road vision, not just to policymakers and workers and unions, but also to employers. Great. Well, I want to build on what all, all of my fellow panelists have said and just to talk really practically about how potentially powerful a political coalition would be between business and labor to lobby in favor of the kinds of things that we need to be successful, investment in infrastructure, in skills, and a tax structure that can support uh, you know, serious investments in infrastructure and skills rather than you know, one and a half trillion dollars of tax cuts for the wealthy and for corporations. And this does go back, I actually do think, I came to, the, to Washington in the early 1990s to, uh, and I, I worked on NAFTA and then I worked at the AFL-CIO for 20 years. And there used to be more of a labor business coalition around issues like infrastructure. And that actually did begin to crumble in the 90s as business saw its interests abroad, around outsourcing rather than around investing in the U.S. economy. And business put a lot of energy into failed free trade agreements and temporary visa programs of trying to, as, and I'm going to be maybe less kind than others have been, to say that this was not just like not paying enough attention. This was a strategy to abandon the U.S. Uh, sector and to put their energy and their, their interests uh, in production abroad for the U.S. market. And in the end, I think what that develops, what that, what that delivers is a, a weak U.S. consumer economy because you can't keep taking the good jobs away and undermining taxes and not paying taxes and then wonder why you don't have the skilled labor that you need and why you don't have, uh, you know, the, the economy doesn't bounce back after a recession for 10, ten whole years. So a high wage, high productivity union workforce um, that is supported by a political coalition that includes domestic uh, businesses as well as labor. Um, outstanding uh, answers, and uh, we, we really kind of got a chance to dig in a bit, but um, I'm sure many of you have much more. Uh, we, we've only scratched the surface on a lot of these issues. Uh, so the, uh, with the limited time we have now, I want to get to one question that we got from the audience, and I think it brings it right back to sort of this policy idea of what we should begin to be doing to drive some of these goals. Uh, the uh, question is, these goals seem to require that the nation commit to an industrial policy rather than leaning 
uh, on uh, or leaning or steering of the economy toward corporations or, or more sort of short-term thinking policy, which sort of led to where we are now. Uh, so how do we overcome the obstacles to making that shift? What do we do to get toward that kind of policy? So I would ask each of you to try to tackle that. Um, uh, do we have enough time for, for everyone or just one answer? So does anyone in particular want to try to take a stab at that? So I would say that you know, part of this is... Um, so I think this is the moment to say that our the current economic philosophy, which is just said, let us produce whatever economy we have, services aren't we getting better, I think people get that that's wrong, that the majority of jobs in America are, you know, not paying decent wages. And we need to raise the quality of every job, but we need to inject this into everything we say as progressives, that our economic policy is to make sure that we're gonna have, we're gonna invest in those parts of the economy that can deliver good paying jobs and a more productive economy. We're not just gonna take whatever the global economy gives us. And if we don't make that shift um, in, a, in a stage where we're not gonna be the world's biggest economy, when China's going to you know, overtake us, we're going to fall further behind. We cannot just be, just bet on being the big gorilla in the room anymore. We have time? One more. Okay. Uh, very quickly. Um, I think for too long, I'll put on my old campaign manager's hat, uh, progressives have sat by while the only vision of economic growth or economic development that has been put forward to the American people is one of lower taxes, less regulation, and they hear it ad nauseum, and that's all they hear. And I think it's very, very interesting that uh, this, what, what's happening here has attracted how many, three, four, five, your various uh, uh, gatherings, five potential Democratic presidential candidates all of whom want to speak to this issue, all of whom see in this, at long last, an alternative <laughs> vision of how economies grow in shared and sustainable ways that the American people have not heard for a long, long time. Uh, so keep it up. This work is absolutely essential. It's essential for, on, a, on a policy basis. It's essential on a political basis. Let me speak to that too before. Yesterday, a group of us, a small team, uh, visited various members uh, uh, on the Hill and, and shared the, the idea and shared the points and the goals. The, uh, and I don't want to overstate this, but there was a palpable sense of excitement about being able to grasp this issue as something that they can carry forward uh, as a real agenda for, uh, for making change. So this, this is, we might be on to something here, folks. So let's, uh, yeah. Um, let me just add quickly to, to that, that, um, you know, in, in D.C. Pol political discourse, industrial policy is kind of a dirty word and has been for quite some time. You know, this sense of picking winners and losers that we're not allowed to do, that it's a, a, a terrible thing. But if you think about it, what we're talking about is a forward-looking, coordinated, thoughtful strategy that combines the different parts of our government action, whether it's our trade policy, our investment in infrastructure, our education policy, thinking about, you know, where is the economy going, where is it going to be. If we look at some of our successful competitors, certainly China or Germany, or you, know, you see countries that are absolutely planning ahead. I mean, China is, I think, the most extreme case of picking winners and losers. But, um, but you know, you, you hear um, American businesses like, well, you know, we can't compete with China because they're investing, they're subsidized, and they're doing other things. But I think we really do need to think, and we need to think together as a country about how we can work together, how we can think ahead, because we're not going to be able to create the skills and the infrastructure in five minutes with, um, you know, sort of short-term profit-driven motives. But we, we are going to be able to do it if we plan five and 10 and 15 years out. I believe we have one more. One more. Okay. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. I, I just say I think it's, it's false to say that we have a choice between an industrial policy and no industrial policy. I think we, we currently have an industrial policy. It's just incoherent. Uh, and, and promotes bad stuff. <laughs> so, so we have a, you know, a tax policy that promotes the interest of finance, that promotes offshoring, 
that promotes uh, non-union uh, development, et cetera. And so then we can think about replacing it with a, an, in a set of coordinated policies across these different areas that Thea mentioned that would actually promote uh, good jobs in sectors like manufacturing, but, but other sectors as well. Thank you, everyone. Please give the panel a hand. And uh, I think we were successful because I'm getting even more questions from the audience. They want to dig into this thing even more, but unfortunately we just don't have the time to really kind of get into it. But I think this is a good way to begin to launch the rest of the, the session. So, um, oh, there we go. So now I probably should say you can have a break. Um, so we, um, but we're, so please try to be back in your seats uh, by 11.45. We will go from the next panel uh, to former Vice President Biden. And so during that stage, partly for security reasons, we're going to ask you one thing to come down to, to not leave uh, the auditorium at the end of the panel, because we're going to go right into his talk. So please take a 30 minute break, but please be back in your panel, in your seat by 11.45. And then I want to personally thank the panelists uh, for basically staying within the time frame. Just <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you guys. <laughs>